So uh, this is a, a paper we presented in SIGMOD last year with a bunch of co-authors. I have stolen slides from, from Javier here and from Diego and added just a few myself. Uh, so, so this, this is about uh, more or less graph pattern matching motivated by information networks that, that can model it as, as graphs. And uh, a particular kind of queries on this graph that is very, very useful is called basic graph pattern queries, which are used for, for extracting information, querying those graphs, uh, mining, and so on. And there are several commercial systems and, and several declarative query language supporting such queries, particularly Sparkle. And the, the idea here for modeling information is that each edge of, of the graph is, is a labeled graph in, 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 the most inter, in the most popular models. They are edge labeled graph where you have one node is a subject, the other node is, an, is called an object and they are connected by an edge that is labeled by so-called predicates. So for example, in this case, the, 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 the paper is uh, the subject the predicate is published at, and the object is the conference. But also here, for example, my co-author is the, the subject, the predicate is the co-author, and the object is the paper. Okay. So the graph is basically modeled as a unique relation of triples, SPO, subject, predicate, object. And the basic graph pattern is a kind of subgraph that you aim to match in the, in the graph where some of the nodes are variables and others are constants. In this particular example, the predicates are always constant and the subjects and objects are variables, but it can be different. And this BGP, this basic graph pattern, for example, aims to find uh, pairs of, of people that work in the same university and co-author the paper that was published in Sigma. Right. So the, the aim of the, of the query is to find assignments to all the variables, right? So that you can find that as a subgraph in your, in your database. So this, this, um, this kind of basic graph patterns are aching to, to join queries basically it can be expressed in, in SQL if you regard the, the set of triples as a relation. Uh, but in general query plans, and when, when, when you have to perform many joins, they can be very inefficient in traditional database systems. Basically, if, if, you, if you regard this as tables, for example, consider these three tables, which are binary tables. So uh, you can see these tables as, uh, as a graph. So for example, there is one row here that is one, two in relation R. That means that you have a, an edge labeled R between nodes one and two. And in this case, a natural join between those tables corresponds to a basic graph pattern. Right, that basically is finding triangles here, per, per st. So joins from the 60s joins in traditional databases were computed pairwise, and all, all the all the work in, in in query optimization was about in which order we perform the pairwise joins in order to to minimize the, the total amount of work. For example, for the triangle query, you have three possible ways of three possible orders in which you can join the, the tables. And, and how you do this impacts a lot of, on the size of the intermediate results. It can be very large or very small, depending on, on how you do it. But the, the, what, what was uh, discovered some, some time ago was that, in general, pairwise join can produce intermediate results that are much larger than the output size, and they give they can give no useful theoretical guarantees in, of, of the time on the time to solve a join in terms of uh, the size of the output. For example, the, this, this is a well-known example is the triangle query. If you have this particular database where you have attributes A, B, and C, and each relation is a set of edges of, of a different color. So you have these three relations. Uh, the maximum output size of this query is n to 1.5, but every pairwise join on this table produces an intermediate result of size n square. So, so um, no, no, no pairwise join based strategy can be optimal in terms of the output size. 
even in the worst case. So the, the notion of worst case optimal join algorithms says that, okay, uh, you have a join algorithm, you have a query Q and the database instance D, and you want to produce the, the, the output with, with which is the, the join or the set of all the assignments, if, if you see it as graphs. And a join algorithm is said to be worst case optimal if you can run in time O of Q star. And this Q star is what is called the AGM bound. And this is essentially the maximum possible output size of this query over, a, over some database that has the same columns and the same sizes as the, the, the database you have at hand. So it's, it's, not, it's not the output size of this query, which will be instance optimality. It's a weaker concept. There is some database so with these columns and this size where this query will have size Q star. So, and then you are required to, to perform in time order of Q star with this tilde means that uh, you are hiding polylog factors and also you are hiding factors that depend on the query size and on the parity of the relation. This is called the data. And then what we're shown is that no plan involving pairwise join can be worst case optimal. So, so um, recent development proposed to use multi-way joins. And in this case, you can reach worst case optimality. There are several uh, worst case optimal join algorithms today, but the most popular is the ones, the so-called leapfrog try join, which proceeds by performing all the joins at the same time, but instantiating the attributes one by one instead of of reducing one by one the relation, it reduces one by one the variables. And basically it uses try-like data structures for, for instantiating the attributes uh, efficiently. So for, for example, if you have this triangle query, what you would do is assume you have tries storing each of the relations. So you have, you regard these uh, rows as strings and you have a, a try with, the, with all the rows. And for example, you first decide to start with X. And then what you do is you get all the possible values of all the values of X that can possibly belong to the output. So basically you project R and T, which are the relations having X. You project the values of X and intersect them. Only those values can be in the output because the join is essentially an intersection, right? So what you have to do is in the, the try of R and the try of T, you intersect the values of the children, which is one, two here, and one, two, three here. And for each such value that you find, you go on to the second variable. And for the second variable, which this time is y, you take from r all the different values of y that are connected with this particular rate, value of, of x, right? And you intersect it with the values of y in the second relation. So basically, you are here in this, you can be here in this node, and then you will be in this node. And for each node of X is where you are, you intersect the children here with the children of the root of S, and then you get two and three, for example. And for each value of Y, you do the same for Z. So you, you will intersect these children here with, with these children here, because you were with X equal one, and so on. And then every, every triple you get, you output it. And this, this, this is worst case optimal. So basically, you have to be in all the tries uh, for all the relation and go and uh, instantiate the variables one by one, descending, intersecting all the children of the involved tries. And for each try, for each um, value that participates in the intersection, you, you instantiate that one and you go on with the next uh, variable. So the key operation here is how to intersect the children of various try nodes for, for all, all, all the, all the the expensive operations here are these intersections, right? So um, going back to, to graphs, basic graph patterns can be evaluated in worst case optimal time using this algorithm. And the idea is that you regard each triple as a relation to join and then as a try. So in our Oh, okay, I have a mistake there. Yeah, this should be uh, you. So you, you have a set of triple patterns with some constant and some variables, and then you take each of these as a, as a relation 
and you proceed with, uh, with the instantiating the variables one by one. So all you need is an efficient implementation of operation leap. The operation leap, what, that, what it does is, is finds the next child of a node having value x or more. Is, is, is the, the primitive you, you use for typical list intersection address, right? You're, you're in one of the list and you have value 30, then you want in the other list the first value that is 30 or more and you, it turns to be 60 and then you return to the first list and say, okay, I want the first that is 60 or more. And when you find the coincidence, you, you have an element of intersection and, and so on. So the, the, the operation basically gets a list of attributes that are already instantiated, for example, it can say the predicate is four, the object is three. And in terms of tries, this defines the try node where you have to operate. GT is, is a constraint that says, okay, some of the remaining variables have to be larger or equal than this value B. And it aims to find the leftmost try node child with value B or more. And it returns the, the first value C it gets. And when you find the same value C in all the tries, in all the involved tries, you go down in all the tries by that variable, right? So this is what the operation means in terms of how it's implemented in terms of tries. So, um, okay. No matter how you order the attributes, the result will be worst case optimal, but worst case optimality is, is turns out to be not, um, not very uh, tight bar. So depending on how you do the instantiation, you can get much better or much worse algorithms, even if all, all of them are worst case optimal. So it's important to choose a, the, a good instantiation order, and this depends on, on, on query optimization. It also may be that some of the variables that are in the relations are not mentioned in the query. So it's, it does, it's not sufficient to have just one try per table. You, you don't know in which order you will want to access the attributes of the table. So basically you need to have one try for every possible order of the attributes. For example, if you are on labeled graph, you need six orders. You need a try that has first the subject, then the predicates, then the object, another has first the predicates, then the object, then the subject, and so on. So you need to multiply the space by six. And in general, if you are in the, in the relational case, if you have D attributes, you have to store D factorial in, in this switch. With, 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 which gets very quickly impractical. And then there are several workarounds like index in some orders and give away worst case optimality for some queries that, that, that can be solved with those orders. Build some of the indexes on the fly so figure out the, the, the cost. Resort to very large indexes on disk and then having to work in much slower medium and, and so on. So, uh, our contribution here was what we call the ring, which is a lightweight representation of a graph. Uh, basically, you regard the graph as a string resulting from concatenating all the triples, building a variant of the BWT on the concatenation, and then using web trees for, for representing the, the BWT. I, I will assume you know what BWT and web trees are, because otherwise it, the, the, the top won't fit in, in that. Um, basically, with the ring, we can simulate leapfrog try join on the six tries at the same time. This, the, this is the, the interesting part. And then we can simulate the worst case optimal algorithm for BGP queries. Because this was tested in practice. Uh, it uses about just 6% additional space beyond the raw data. Right? And it, it's quite competitive with the traditional alternative that just orders of magnitude more space. So basically the idea is that we will regard the triples as if they were cyclic and bidirectional. And in this way, any of these orders can be obtained by traversing the ring in some direction, starting at some node. This is the, 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 the high level idea. So um, we will regard the triples as, as text and the graph is the concatenation, is a text that is the concatenation of the triples. We will create a modified Barros will transform so that the triples can be navigated cyclically. And this will make every node of, the, of every try will correspond to a contiguous area in the BWT. And then the operation leap can be computed efficiently using the wavelet trees. And we will store the wavelet trees using compact or compressed uh, representations. 
So for example, if you, if you have this set of triples, okay, we, we shift the predicates and the objects so that all the subjects are smaller than all the predicates and these are smaller than all the objects. We concatenate all the triples and put the terminator that, that is larger, not smaller than all the others. And this produces, we build the suffix array and the BWT, and this makes all the subjects come before all the predicates and come before all the objects. And then in the BWT, which, which stores the preceding symbol, you have all the objects together, all the subjects together, and all the predicates together, with some exception with the big out here at the end of, of the text. So um, if you use the LF function on the BWT that lets you traverse the, the text backwards, we have that, for example, if we are at this predicate corresponding to this position in the text and we take the LF, we go to the corresponding subject. But then when we go backward, you, you get the object of the previous triple and you would instead like to go to the object of your triple. You, you would like to traverse them cyclically. So it is enough to, um, to just shift, uh, put this last element here and, and remove this, this dollar. And then it turns out that if you're here, you go to the subject and then it sends you to the object, but now you have shifted this so you will get the corresponding object. And from there, you will go to the predicate again and the subject and the object and so on. So you, you will, we, we just this small change, which is known in, in the community, but in this particular case, it's, it's particularly easy to, to, to obtain. Uh, so with this variant of the BWT, you have cyclic triples. And then what happens is that, as I said, every, every node in the tri corresponds to some range in, in, the, in the BWT. So for example, you can have uh, here all the predicates that start with the B, and here you have listed all the subjects that precede them, uh, or, or you can have the subjects, and then you can see the objects that precede them, or you can have, uh, for example, predicates and subjects are fixed. So you have still a sub range of, of the subjects that are followed by this predicate. And still you can get the objects from there. So every, every, every train node corresponds to a contiguous part of, the, of this range. So how do you implement the backward leap? For example, suppose that you are here in, in simulating a train node of predicates, which corresponds to a range in the BWT of all the predicates P, and you want the first subject that is larger than X here. So you want to find basically this subject S. So what you do is in the, in the wavelet tree of this part of the BWT, you manage to obtain the first value that appears here, that is the smallest value that appears here, and that is X or, or, or larger. So the, the wavelet tree, this is called range next value and then it's implementing logarithmic time with wavelet trees. So you get the S here and this is operation leap. Then if you want to, if you decide by, finally to descend by, by this S, what you do, you, you perform a typical backwards, backwards step operation from the range of predicates to the range of subjects, which are the S that are here. They are now here in the area of the subjects that are the subjects followed by the predicate. So it's SP that corresponds to this node, that is PS. Uh, instead, you may have to move forward. For example, you are in a node P and you want <coughs> to find the first object, uh, the first child that is an object. This is another try, it's PO. The previous was PS. You're simulating different tries. And the first object that is X or more. So basically you go to the objects, to the first object that is uh, X or more, you map it to, the, to this range of predicates and you will find the first predicate that is followed by some object that is O, X or more. This time is O prime. So from here, the wavelet tree leads you to O prime. You know where the O primes end and you get back and you then limit this new sub range of P that are the piece that are followed by O prime. And this corresponds to going down in this track. So now this range corresponds to this node in the, in the track. Okay. So basically you can simulate backward search and forward search in the modified BWT and the wavelet tree operations allow one to implement the leapfrog try jump. The space usage is uh, just sublinearly more than the plane representation of the graph 
It can be compressed if you, if you use compressed bit vectors, for example, for the weight of trees. And all the primitives take log u time where u is the, is the universe size. I think I forgot to say that. So the query time is q star, which is the, 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 the worst case optimal size, times the size of the query times log u, which is quite the standard. And the wavelet tree is also useful for, optim for optimization because it can very easily tell you uh, how selectivity, how selective are the, the triple patterns you start with. So you can use that to choose which variable to instance it first, trying to instance the more uh, selective ones first. So we tested that on, on, uh, on, on Wikidata. This is a small subset that we also tried with the, with the full set. And uh, compare the ring to state of the art solutions on a graph pattern benchmark that features all these topologies and, and 50 queries of each, each of these topologies. Um, basically, in terms of time, uh, there are, there are uh, queries where the ring performs significantly better than the others. Somewhere it performs basically the same as, as, the, as the next best, and somewhere it goes significantly worse. But if you take the total time, uh, you get the, the, the best average time overall. So it's a quite stable structure. Uh, the next best is, is the uh, leapfrog try join implemented on, on Jena data structure. And the space, you need 12 bytes per triple for in a, in a raw representation. This is 12.7. So just a small percent on top of, of the size of the raw data compared with this with the sizes of, with the typical sizes of, of, of other engines, which are at, at least an order of magnitude more. There is uh, an empty head, which is a very, very fast one, but it's 150 times larger. And also the compressed version is half the size, so half the size of the original data. Uh, it's not any more the fastest, but it's still competitive. Uh, it's, it's, it's just the, the, the next best after Jena Leapfrog try join. So here are the results in, in, in the map of uh, size on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. And um, OK, this, this is about the ring. Now, uh, returning to relational databases, you have tables with uh, dimensions more than three, of course. And here we managed to prove that with the ring index, you need only order of two to the d orders instead of d factorial. And the query time is grows nicely with the dimension, just the d square factor. Uh, so the dimension is, is the number of attributes right in the in the tables. So um, this w here corresponds to the flat index that needs exactly d factorial uh, tries, and the last one is the ring index. The other intermediate are, are, are weak variants of weak intermediate variants. So we need just one ring for the case of of triples. For quads, we need just two indexes instead of 24. And this is still manageable. We need five copies of the data, seven copies of the data, uh, instead of 700. Right? So this makes worst case optimal algorithms usable on, on, on much wider tables than before. But OK, at some point, it becomes quickly unmanageable anyway. So if you have eight attributes, you don't want to pay 20 times the, the, the size of the data anyway. So for the future, we're, we're thinking in, in combining this with, with reification, which means essentially cutting the tables horizontally and, and use an external key, and having to perform joints on, on them in order to reconstruct the map query time. There are other opportunities for query optimization using the wavelet trees that give you more, more interesting data than, than plain representations. In particular, choosing the variables to instantiate adaptively according to the results you obtain as, as, as you go. Um, as many compact data structures, this is uh, static. You cannot think dynamism, but for now, we only have thought of uh, using classic solutions. Um, Sparkle 1.1 includes stronger queries than basic graph patterns, in particular, regular path queries. We, we, we have already obtained good results on this. And we believe this can be also useful for graph analytics, where where you have some, some basic graph pattern and you want to know how many matches it has in, instead of just listing them all. 
and we believe that web trees can be good for that because they are good for, for counting how many results before producing them one by one. So I think uh, for this workshop, it was a nice example of compressive computation, how you can do it uh, equally well, even faster sometimes within space that is basically that of the data you are encoding just by using more clever encoding. And that's it. <laughs>